Hey, what is up guys? It's your boy Speed here, and congratulations to LGD. I'm sure everyone feels the same way that I do, which is it was a great tournament. Great production quality, great games, and overall just a great experience. And really, I can't wait for TI. I'm honestly so excited. I hope that they do in-person, uh, you know, seatings, that they actually sell tickets. I don't think it's gonna happen. I really hope it does, but nonetheless, Let's get into this match. I want to do a draft analysis of game three between EG and LGD. I felt like this was the hardest outdraft of all three games, which might seem crazy considering game one and how much of a stomp it was. I just felt like the picks in this game, the Naga in particular, uh, was so devastating. And let's get into it. But without further ado, if you guys could smash the like button and subscribe to the channel, I really would appreciate it. And also want to let you know that we're going to be making a couple of great website videos. You might be wondering what those website videos are going to be. I'm going to be doing a replay and draft analysis for both game one and two of the grand finals as well. So if you enjoy this video, you're going to want to catch the other two on the website. Literally double the content. But yeah, click the link down below. Go subscribe. And I really think you guys are going to enjoy it. You got to you got to check it out. All right. So let's get into the draft. I'm going to spend less time on the draft and more time on the actual game. But First things first, we have a first pick line and then a response Axe Marana. Now, I wouldn't say in particular there's anything too special here. However, I'm obviously a big fan, and I'm sure LGD is too, of this first phase Axe. The flexibility of their team to have Axe as an offlaner and a safe laner was destructive to EG in this game 3. They first face these two heroes, okay, it's a good lane, just straight up, it's a good matchup. Uh, Jenkins even talked about it on the panel. Axe can cut waves, play alone, Marana can farm when that happens, and there's a great combo for that. Uh, just in the mid game as well, right? Call into Arrow, very basic but very effective. Even being able to make Axe Invis so he can get a good jump makes a lot of sense. Um, the line, I think it's a fine opener for AG. They've been winning plenty of games with it. Totally respect this opener. But really what I like about this Axe is what they do later on with it, and we'll get into that when the time comes. After that, EG responds with the TA, which once again, I'm okay with it. I think TA is one of the better heroes against Axe. Axe is a hero with naturally very low armor. He typically doesn't really buy armor items. And so all throughout the game, TA is one of the best heroes to kill Axe. Also, Murana does instant base damage. And so TA looks good already. I mean, not that you have too much info, but it looks solid. I, I think if you're going to first phase a mid here, it's going to be the TA or Puck, but Puck is banned. Next up, I want to briefly talk about bans. I think the two best offlaners, strength offlaners, in my opinion, in this current meta are Timber and Tide. Now, of course, it depends on the game. I think in particular, uh, I'm just a huge fan against uh, of Timber against Axe, even though <laughs> game one, it obviously didn't look like that. <laughs> you know, I still think that matchup is good, regardless of how that one game went. Tidehunter just makes sense. You know, it's very hard for you to get bursted, so you're a really good counter initiation against Axe. Also, the minus armor from Gush is really good. I talked about the armor issues for Axe just as is. You combine that with Meld and Gush, and all of a sudden, you actually insta-die even with like 2k HP, you just die. It really is like that. And so I love these bands. And then AA, I just think this is the, maybe, I, I want to say it, it's the best five of the patch. I really believe that. Maybe Wyvern is up there as well. I think Wyvern is so versatile right now, but it, really up there. EG goes for the Razor, Lesh, and Viper bands. Really, in my opinion, just trying to protect this TA, which makes sense. They're going to first phase TA. You want to protect it. LGD goes for the DP, which definitely is not a response necessarily to the TA, at least in the laning stage, but it is in the mid and late game. Spirit Siphon XO, you get on top of her with Yules, BKB, etc., and you can do a lot of damage. It's also just good team fight with the Marana on the Axe. It's the damage that these heroes can lack, you know, assuming it's an Axe offlane. Obviously, Axe safe lane doesn't lack damage, but Axe offlane, when he goes like Blink Vanguard, which I believe is what he went this game into like another defensive item, uh, you're not going to do the damage. So I like the DP follow up. I also believe that DP, even after getting nerfed, Maybe LGD just makes it look good, but I, it just seems like it does so much damage. Both games. It was so sad. Both games. It had no game. It had no game. He, I mean, he was getting crushed. Both games. Two and three. And yet, still, in the team fights, he decimated them. I mean, it just goes to show, like, the value in this hero, because it, it can take very little space and do much more than a lot of other heroes. Like... I mean, the silence this game, the silence onto the Terror Blade multiple times killed him. And we'll see that. Then we see the Tusk response. I, I can get behind this once again, doubling down on killing Axe with physical. Good with the TA, good save. I'm not a huge fan of Tusk line though. I will say that. I just, 
Like, I see these two heroes, and I just think it's too much single target. Like, right then, and, like, these three picks, it is a, a way of drafting where you kind of all in on just exploding people, which is what these three heroes can do, which is why this Wyvern response pick is so freaking good, because, okay, you tag team, that is the most obvious, if someone gets hex tag teamed on, which is what you're gonna do, you're gonna initiate with Lion, you're gonna tag team, it is the most obvious cold embrace in Dota. You really cannot get a better cold embrace than that. Really. I played Tusk once against a crit in a pub. Every time I clicked tag team, the person was cold embraced. In the laning stage, it didn't matter. I couldn't kill anybody. It's such a bad... Tusk it, Wyvern is so bad, I, can, I can't even describe it. It is unplayable because even snowball saves, you're going to get cursed right after. Like, I just... I think this Wyvern pick is so good. I, I honestly, I don't really get the Tusk that much. It is snowball save against Axe. It's snowball save against Arrow. I don't like it necessarily. I mean, it can explode DP. Like, I I've actually seen this matchup a couple times where you do so much burst that DP can't necessarily heal, so I get it. But you already have Lion and TA. I don't know. I, I They needed a frontliner. I get the Tusk here. I don't even know what they would pick instead. Like, I just feel like maybe I'd prefer for the offlaner to be a strength hero, but I mean, Axe is picked. The other two are banned. There's Mars. <sighs> Mars, maybe? But, like, I don't like... I mean, Mars doesn't look necessarily that great against these heroes. Ugh. It was it was tough. Um, obviously, hindsight's 2020. The Venno pick. I do like Venno here. I'm going to keep it 100. I, I saw the Venno pick. I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. They need a frontliner. There you go. It's Venno. It's anti-healing against DP Wyvern. It kites Axe. Axe call does nothing to Venno because it's not like you can like buy Blade Mail and do anything to him. So like that match, it's not a good lane. It's a great Venno game. Like I see, the, I, I'm like, I love Venno here. It really is awesome. The Vessel build too makes so much sense. They need a Vessel carrier against these two heroes, even three. Love the pick here. Absolutely love the pick here. And um, yeah, I, I really felt like EG with the Venom pick here had a chance to win the game and win the lanes. Like, I like this Tusk Venom lane. I think a lot of carry heroes here would absolutely struggle to play the game. Now, this is where EG forgets about Naga. And to be fair, I'm, I once again, I think it's really important for us as Dota analyzers, whether or not you're doing it yourself or you're watching a video and just taking in from my information i think people do this all the time where they see a team win and then they or, or a hero win or an item build win and then it gets overhyped i do this you do this we all do this even like lgd i think was a little bit overhyped which seems crazy i know maybe i'll talk about that in the future i don't know but i mean they did crush they're, they're not that overhyped <laughs> i'm gonna get some flack for that it's not i'm not trying to say i think they're bad uh, i i would have to make another point on that but Nonetheless, uh, the Naga pick is, I mean, I literally do not think there's a hero here that I like against Naga. Maybe Lion Shard. I, I, for a second though, during the game, we'll have to check it out. It looked like the Lion Shard didn't even kill the Naga illusions. Am I crazy? Maybe I'm crazy. We'll have to take a look. But um, yeah, it, it's a nice Naga game. They go for the TB. Naga Sirens in response. Literally nothing against Naga. I mean, your Q purges reflection, Manta purges reflection. You have Song to reset the, the meta, which the panel talked about plenty of times. EG picked this matchup for themselves. Uh, mana Burn destroys TB if, if that happens. And yeah, I mean, it's it's such a good lane. Tusk Venno is not good against Naga. It's very simply put. Hire more hero against Tag Team with Cold Embrace. And you can purge Gale with your Q if you need to. You can even purge the W. Not that it does that much because Venno can reapply it. But it's such an easy lane. It's just, yeah, it was perfect. It's also set up for Marana Arrow. It's set up for DP. You might be saying, what do you mean? It's, I mean, you can silence out of the Naga song pretty easily in the early game. So there's that. But really, it just allows DP to get on top of the target that she wants. For instance, if she wants to go on the Venno, because like if Venno gets gone on by DP with no defensive items, like proper defensive items, Venno is going to die. So will TA if DP itemizes for that reason. And so, yeah, it, it was so good. Once again, I mean, the, the TB pick, it makes sense. It like, it kills DP through everything. It kills Axe. It, it's like a decent lane against Axe as well. But Naga finishes it off. And now let's get into the game. We're currently nine minutes in. And, and honestly, things are kind of going in as expected. Axe is doing fine. TB's doing fine. Venno is down on net worth to the Naga, but is doing fine. You don't lose the lane, but you don't win it and the TA beat the DP. However, TA crushed DP. There's a couple of good rotations that also 
uh, netted them a few kills onto the DP as well. And so that was like a massive, massive win. The mid lane was was really what might have carried EG this game coming out of the laning stage. Now, the first clip I want to talk about, I'll, look in, I'll be looking at various clips this game. I just want to do that instead of just kind of looking at, at the entire game or entire player. I'm going to be looking at some plays that I thought were bad that costed certain teams the game and some plays that I thought were good. So the first play of the game was from crit that I didn't like. This one, I really feel like that crit should not be shoving the lane here. So what I mean by this is crit right now is in a great setup. All of EG's in a great setup. I love their map movement here. The Venno is taking over this this jungle, so he's just kind of jungling. You know, the best way to play Venno <laughs> is, you know, it's in the jungle. And so he's taking over this portion of the map. This is what Venno does. He plants himself and says, this is my part of the map. Love it. Love it. This, this is what I think you should do. TA is forming the triangle and TB is sort of forming the bottom wave and these two camps. And then what they're doing as well is they're letting TA farm mid because she's sort of the carry. Right? They do have very greedy cores here. And they're letting the supports get their levels top, right? Crit is going to get get uh, some levels up here and hit level 7 around minute 10. You might be saying, oh, but he's almost level 5. How does he hit level 7? Well, he's going to take the Tome as well. And a high level Tusk is what you want. This hero under leveled doesn't feel too good. You want to hit that level 7 as soon as possible. That's when tag team becomes really strong. However, what I don't like that he does here is EG is trying to control the map right now. They're trying to take this portion, right? We draw a bit of a line. This is their map. This is LGD's map. Um, and it's, in my opinion, it's favored for EG just based on the number of camps that they have. However, it doesn't become favored uh, if crit pushes in the wave. And we saw this from OpenAI a while ago where they would have, when the game static and not much was happening, they would have a support static the lane. They wouldn't push it in. I do not understand the value of crit shoving the lane here. You're going to see he's auto attacking the wave. And the reason I say this is you'll see in a minute, that's when the consequences come into play because he could have instead just not auto attacked and auto denied. You actually aggro deny the creeps and then he could keep the lane back as much as humanly possible. And of course, this is up for debate. I actually hope uh, Crit sees this. I have no idea if he will or not. Maybe you guys want to tweet this segment at him or I don't know. I will, but he shoves the lane. He's going to back up for a second, but then he does it again. And the problem with this is it's not that it instantly gives um, right Ame the farm on his Naga, but it does eventually. Ame on Naga can't farm the wave if it's here. He could send illusions, but it's inconvenient. It's out of the way, and it's not what you want to do as a carry. You don't want to send illusions up to the tier two. They're much easier to deal with in that case. But when the illusions are very close to your tier one, it's not really a problem. Maybe Crit felt like he wanted to shove it in so he could go somewhere else, but you could go somewhere else without shoving it in. So I don't think that's really the case. I just want you guys to, to see this as like a an advanced learning opportunity. Um, once again, people will doubt this. This is something that, you know, it, it's always hard for me to disagree with the pros or disagree with the play that they make, but this is one that I feel pretty strongly on, so I want to put in the video. Yeah, they do end up going sort of on Ame here, but you can see he clears up the wave. And imagine, think about it, imagine if Ame had to farm a wave up here and go into the jungle to get this top wave, right? Imagine, he would die to a rotation from Abed. And so instead, that doesn't happen. He gets to calmly go back to farming the wave and gets a lot of items. And I just, I really feel like that's like a big part of why Ame gets a good start here. I mean, not that he wouldn't have ha had anything, but he would have had to split a lot more farm with his other cores regardless. I know I'm harping on this a lot. I just want to talk about it. Moving into the mid game, it was actually about even. Um, EG has this great deep port here that actually allows him to spot out the Naga and kill her later on. And just to talk about that great ward that I mentioned a second ago, um, I think it, it really does set up for a Roshan play. And that's when people tell me like, oh, I, you know, I, I can't, I can't gain MOR, so five, I don't know what to do. Small wars and play calls, and yes, of course, of course, EG is gonna be more willing to make a play around a ward than your average pub, obviously. But look at this ward, this one right here scouts this rotation from the Wyvern and Naga into the jungle. And because of that, they're able to get a full collapse. And this full collapse turns into a Naga and a Wyvern kill. And most importantly, the Roshan. When you pick TA, obviously you wanna get that Roshan as soon as possible. So it ends up being a great fight for EG. Straight into the pit, and the game was looking decent here. Now, the biggest problem about this game for uh, EG is by far going to be 5v5 team fights. We haven't seen one yet, and when we do see them, it's not going to look good. And that's why team fight in general tends to do a little bit better in pubs. Uh, if you look at high win rate heroes, heroes uh, that are notorious for winning pubs, a couple of, of examples 
are like Spectre and Zeus, and it's because of ease of execution and the high damage that they do. And even in Pro Dota, there's kind of aspects of this, you know, heroes like DP and Wyvern, compared to something like a Lion and a Tusk in the mid to late game, it's just not, it's not very close on the impact that they're generally going to have. I'm not saying that a Tusk can't have a clutch snowball save, or you can't get a great Hex to counter initiate on a call, or to catch a Naga before she can get any illusions off, but frankly, that's unlikely to happen when you have uh, a Naga and, and Imrana, you're going to have a lot of vision advantage. They do have the Venoe in, in response to that. But all right, let's get into some team fights. OK, so the first disaster team fight for EG is when Ame um, decides to bait bottom. And, and I really do believe that this is a bait more than anything because of the way he's able to react extremely quickly and for the fact that he saw them. So as we go bottom here, Ame is going to send illusions. They are I believe they're no, they weren't smoked. OK, did they smoke? I thought they smoked. No, they just actually walk in here. Okay, but Ame saw the tusk. Okay, and usually that would be your cue to run straight backwards, right? He saw him there, he even pinged him out. That's your cue typically to run straight backwards. But this is why he's a great carry player, because instead of panicking like most players would, he walks forward, right? Walks forward, gets gone on by the tusk, pops the manta, instantly songs. The proper reaction there, absolutely the the best reaction. That sets up for an arrow onto the TA, and you might be saying, hmm, speed. Why would they go on a TA if she has Aegis? Seems pretty bad. The problem with <laughs> TA Aegis in a situation like this is if you get chain stunned, you're just going to get stuck in the middle. And TA hates being stuck in the middle of the fights. Why does she buy Dragonlance and take the ranged challenge? Because she wants to stay on the outside, play around the outside, play around side blades, and one shot heroes from the side. So when you go on a hero like TA, when she's stuck in the middle, it's gonna be a good fight even with Aegis. We saw this in game two as well. Arteezy on the Nature's Prophet would walk up the high ground with Aegis, and yet they went on him anyway. Why? Because he's a squishy ranged hero. This is what you guys can learn from this. Even if there's a squishy ranged hero with Aegis, for instance, SF, Sniper, Prophet, Marana, any of these heroes, if they have Aegis and they are in a bad position, you should still go on them so the fight happens in this bad position. Does that make sense? This fight is in a great spot for LGD. The panel talked about this as well. Every, like, literally, LGD has some of the best fight selection in all of Dota. They are so good at taking fights in their vision, around their towers, and um, it really wins them the game. And that's what happens here. We see a, a, a nice initiation, a bit of miscommunication here from the Axe and the Marana because the arrow came out. He still considered calling TA, which is obviously a mistake. But now the TA gets gone on. Not what you want to see. You do not want <laughs> to be like this. And this is the problem with the Veno pick here. It's a slow hero. It doesn't buy Blink Dagger. It doesn't stun. And therefore, when your TA gets gone on, what do you want to have? What do you want to have? You want Ravage. You want Ravage. You want Arena. You don't want Poison Nova. And so as much as I like this Venno pick and I said in the draft that I liked it, it, it's good for the lanes and it was good for the early game for shutting down portions of the map. We saw that, but it doesn't team fight well, which sounds weird. Um, it does give vision for the team fights, but the thing is that's out of the picture here considering Venno is going in last, which is worst case scenario for EG. Literally, I, I it was just such a weird play call from EG. I guess they felt like they can burst the Naga. It was so risky, but... Man, he's going in last, and now when he does come in, it doesn't do anything because it's a Veno. A Veno needs to go in first and die. He needs to go in first and die, like a lot of sperm cells. And that's just not what happens here, All right? And, and RTZ, I mean, he doesn't do any damage. I don't really get why he didn't buy Dragonless this game. I feel like that's a must buy on TB. I get that the Axe is really good against Naga because you can pop it, so you get meta for like 10 seconds, and then if she songs that fake meta, then it's not that bad. So like, I love the Ags idea on, on TB against Naga, but um, yeah, nonetheless, I just such a disastrous fight. Really, the TB was the most depressing part here. Look at this. I swear to God, it looks like they're damage hacking. His, his HP just, I mean, just goes away. <laughs> just goes away. And then the curse, the follow-up curse onto the lion after the TA respawns. And that's what I'm saying. She just gets chain controlled, couldn't move. Oh, Ice 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 comes in, no protection. And so, yeah, I just want to go back to quickly the point on the Veno here, at least Veno with TA and TB. It's definitely not one of the best heroes. It can be good early game because early game slows are more effective. Keep that in mind. For the first 10, 15 minutes of the game, slows are often actually better than stuns because typically they last longer. It depends on the heroes, obviously. 
But once the game gets late, the lack of stuns from EG as, as a frontline hero, an AoE disable that can protect TA and TB, you're not protecting them with, with Impel or Ice Shards or Snowball. Snowball save is, is often not good enough. Snowball saves in general, honestly, Tusk as a safe hero, in my opinion, is ridiculously overrated. Every time I see a snowball save, like, not every time, the large majority of the time, the person just dies anyway. <laughs> so, it, it kind of just depends on the team, but yeah, let's get into the next fight. And next, let's do a quick crash course on collapsing the map. Right here, we see Naga pushing in top. Very good. We see Naga pushing in top, Axe pushing in bottom. Guys, always remember in PUBG, you don't have to five man all the time. It's very crucial that especially when you get ahead and you win a fight, you don't necessarily clump up and run to the tower. Okay, actually, I even want to look back here after they won this engagement. Look at what they did, okay? So, as we go back, this is when they wipe them. Look at the movements of the map, okay? Naga goes bottom, Axe bottom, DP to mid. They're not clumping up. They're not necessarily going for a tower. After Naga pushes in bottom, she shifts to top. To be honest, maybe she should have just went top right away. I think she just wants to farm priority though, which which makes a lot of sense to me. But Axe goes bottom, DP goes mid. Naga is now going to run to the top side as soon as possible. When you win a fight, get the lanes in in the early game. Lanes are far more important than objectives in the early game, unless it's like mid-tier 1 or Roshan, okay? You want to get those lanes in like 15 to 25-ish. It's so much more important because obviously net worth and items is what's going to win you the fight and the lane positioning. Because now we see the Naga Illusions mid. We see bottom wave is all, all the way in. So if someone wants to push that out, they're going to have to show in a very awkward position, right? They want to farm bottom. Look where they're going to have to go. You think that's good if you have to go bottom here? No, you're going to show across the map from your team. That's horrible. And so now Naga's going to continue to shove in top, okay? TA shows mid. Axe continuing to stay bottom, continuing to farm. Why? Because they're not looking to fight. They're looking to use Naga to shove the waves. This is what illusion carries do best. TB does it as well, but not nearly as good as Naga at this point in the game, especially when Naga is um, 2k net worth ahead of him, right? Almost half an item ahead on him. And um, so, yeah, now TB shows bottom. Illusion's in, in top. Look at where EG has to be here. They're completely collapsed on just because of the waves. This is the biggest advantage of winning a fight, which pub players never do. And honestly, to be honest, will almost never do uh, unless it's very high more because it takes kind of just a lot of discipline. And that this is what we see next. The TB shows bottom. Instantly, we see Naga walk up the cliff. And this is really cool. It's really cool because when you see the TB bottom, you can kind of assume, OK, they're probably not looking to fight. They're not together, at least. And we saw a smoke come out from the rest of the team. So a smoke comes out from the rest of the team. We see the Naga walk up this cliff. What does this what does this usually do in the human mind when you see the hard carry alone in the jungle? You probably assume the rest of the team is behind her, right? Because usually they are. Usually they are. You wouldn't want your Naga to be alone. But you can bait. You can bait. That's what we see here. This Naga is really tanky as well. I would argue it's almost impossible for them to kill him. Fly even thought it was illusions, funny enough, I think. I think that's why he would hex. Quickly realizes it's not an illusion. And uh, yeah, the Veno shows mid, so I know I'm not showing it here, but Veno sees Arteezy, he- Look! Ah, oh, that's so great! Oh my god! Mwah! Ah, oh, the- Ah, oh, it just brings joy to my heart. It really does. It really does. These mind games and the stuff these pros think of in the moment, it just- Ah, voila. That's all I have to say. Look, if you don't know what I'm talking about, look. This is- This is- Ice Ice Ice's Veno. He draws a line here. He's like, this is where they are. He's like, they are here. If this is real, they are here. Ice 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 makes the correct read because that's usually where they would be. A team. Oh my god, he even pinged. Maybe he did know he was going to get jumped. Maybe Ice 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 is just a goat, which he actually is. He's so good. He is, in my opinion, he's like maybe the best baiter in Dota. This guy sets up fights better than almost anyone else. Like, I, I'm serious about that, guys. You, you should watch him on that. But he gets jumped. I guess maybe he even knew. Yeah, I think he kind of did know, so... <laughs> Uh, that just goes to show how good even Ice 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 is. He, he even sort of sees that read. Maybe he thought he was going to get jumped a little bit later, though. I don't think he expected to jump that quick. He probably assumed they were maybe going to be a little bit later because obviously his team was not in position to protect him. And yeah, now it's a disaster. Uh, obviously, TB is nowhere in position to fight. Tusk is not in, in position to snowball save the Veno. That's another great objective. They take this mid tower. What are they going to do next? What are they going to do next, guys? Huh? What are they going to do next? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think they're going to do next? It's not go high ground. It's not go high ground. Why? Because they have a Naga. 
Naga doesn't go high ground early into the game, unless you're like way ahead and you have a heart. So what do they do instead? Shove in the waves. DP top, axe mid, illusions in the triangle. Honestly, maybe they even went a little bit too far up here. Naga TPing bottom like that kind of does give EG a chance to clear them out of the jungle. To be fair, they do end up getting out. No kills. Um, kills left, but yeah, they get the waves in. Honestly, I, they even kind of did in a bit of a weird way there. Maybe they felt like their cooldowns were down. They, they did use a couple of cooldowns, such as the Mrana ulti, but yeah. Nonetheless, once again, they're just going to try to get the waves in. Naga Illusions go out mid and top. Once again, trying to provide information, and I even think they're a little bit weary of an EG smoke here. EG not showing on any lanes at all. You know, kind of uh, gives you the feeling that, hey, maybe they're trying to kill us. Turns out that's not the case. EG was just really afraid of themselves and was just farming. But you can see LGD is kind of waiting. Um, I think they're mainly waiting for for the Mirana ulti to come up to make another play. They could also be waiting for the, the Roshan fight that is likely to happen as we see the arrow come out. Uh, Roshan is respawning soon, so they're sort of they're sort of starting to posture around that. And I think this is another advanced thing I'm actually learning here, which you guys can learn as well. When Rosh is coming up, I stress this in, all, in, in almost all my videos when I talk about like just general gameplay. Roshan is Dota. It really is a huge part of mid to late game Dota. Aegis, Aegis, Roshan. I mean, just look at how the pros fight around him. They clearly think that. And so they back up because if they were to get picked off, one pick off can turn into a bad Roshan fight, which turns into a team wipe, which turns into an Aegis, which turns into a random 5k net worth lead in an Aegis for EG. And that is what you want to avoid. And so instead, they wait for the Mron ulti. They see Roshan's not up. So they make this like rap play. They send Naga Lucian's mid once again. You always want to try to use your, your like safe shove wave hero to safe shove waves. They're continuing to revolve around Roshan. They send the DP briefly bottom. They want to shove this in. He's got bots. They want to shove this in and maybe try to even force rotation bottom perhaps, right? Because that would obviously set up for a potential great play uh, on the Roshan. Now going back, I think EG sees the DP bottom. So like maybe this is a bit of a gap to Rosh, but they're not all bottom. And then, yeah, we see the worst fight of the game for EG here. This really uh, felt like the nail in the coffin, even though they... Probably weren't even in their coffin yet. It was already built for them, that's for sure. This Naga is such a problem at this point. This Ags is kind of broken. If you don't know what it does, you can net people when they're spell immune and sleeping, which is nutty. Like, if you net Tusk when he's sleeping, he can't snowball. However, if you sleep Tusk and then try to net him when it ends, you can't do it. Snowball will come out first. So, it destroys that hero. It destroys TA. It's actually really good against TB if he goes BKB as well. Uh, and, and it reduces the cooldown and cast rage, so it's really one of the better ags in the game. I, I, I've heard a lot of people theory crafting. I have a friend who theory crafted it and thinks it's relatively broken as well, and I can feel that, but Ardizi shows top. I, I, maybe they were trying to bait? Maybe they're trying to bait Ardizi, but it's just kind of weird because he doesn't have, like, BKB. If he gets silenced, he's silenced, right? And, I mean, they realize that because they TP in on the cart. It just seems weird to me that he shoves the wave with his main hero here. I, I don't get why. I mean, maybe he felt like they were just kind of AFK here playing the Roshan game. I get that. But why would you take that chance? Definitely a mistake. Once again, hindsight's 2020. I'm obviously saying that in a very critical way. I easily could have made the same mistake. You know, emotions are, are high and, and it's it's tough. But he gets gone on. He gets silenced. It's, uh, he's dead. And that ends up being obviously bad because that's the pickoff I talked about. This one pickoff turns into Roshan, and Roshan turns into a lot more than just an Aegis. Now, lucky enough for EG, that actually ended up not turning into a Roshan fight. Uh, I, I'm sorry, into an Aegis, because they didn't have Exo. So, honestly, this ends up being pretty okay. They don't have Exo, they don't have Song. Uh, they even ended up picking off Murana, and so things looking not too bad for EG. In fact, they end up going in here, the Shiva's Veno, onto the front line. Good positioning for my size size. I've said it a million times. This guy knows how to position. He's just really good at positioning. He gets gone on, gets the vessel, understood that the Manta and the Q is popped, so everything onto the Naga cannot be dispelled. And she actually ends up dying um, just to the TA. Now, unfortunately, this kind of causes TA to go pretty far out of position. It also burned the entire TA uh, <laughs> BKB because of the Ag's net. Yeah, uh, it goes to BKB. So... She couldn't move, and that ends up being a quite the disaster. And now we see the Roshan fight finally come to an end here with this engagement. And LGD looks like bots. What I mean by that 
is they look like literal robots. The way they execute this fight was so clean. Ahmed gets jumped by the axe, okay? Makes sense, you want the axe to go in first in this lineup, okay, great. Then he's gonna get snowballed on, the DP's gonna go in second with her BKB, try to initiate the fight, gets gone on, the cold embrace comes out. EG tries to burst the DP, as I said, if Tusk goes on someone, easiest cold embrace of your life. You know they're gonna get snowballed, stunned, and then punched. So, that happens, the cold embrace comes out, DP gets saved. On top of that, the axe completely zones them out on the backline, fight looking good. Then the song comes out, okay? This shards was freaking dope from crit. I don't even know if that's intentional. I really hope it's not because if it is, no one is nearly as good as EG and no, you guys have no chance. <laughs> I mean, how could you, I don't know if that's intentional. But I think it was just for revision to be honest and maybe to, to just kind of block off that area, but <laughs> nonetheless, it traps her while she's PKB. But the song comes out and it's just like they do just enough damage to kill this Venno. Look, they send the illusions onto him. Doesn't commit with the main hero. Most people would make the mistake to go in with the main hero. Why? Because you're just going to get impaled. You're going to get galed and such. And then it's going to be really hard for you to re-engage in, what, eight seconds when your illusions come back up. And so great playing around the illusions. The DP goes for the siphon and the Q. She knows she can frontline. Most people would have panicked here. They're like, Wah! my team is all running away. I'm supposed to man up. This is why he won the major. He mans up because he still knows that the cold embrace is behind them. He knows that the reinitiation from the axe is still there if needed. And it's another one fight. But yeah, this is what I'm talking about with this this Wyvern being better than the Lion. I mean, uh, cold embrace is so good. He doesn't even have holy locket yet. He didn't even go for it first, which by the way, everyone watching, holy locket first on Wyvern might be the most, this is going to get a lot of hate, but I actually think it's so overrated to go holy locket first on Wyvern. You can, people are going to be like, my speed, have you looked at the numbers? Have you looked at the, no do you, have you seen the numbers on Wyvern? It's, are you kidding me? I I know the numbers. It's like my favorite position five in the game. All I do is watch Dota. I know the numbers. The problem is, have you seen the cast range on Wyvern? If you don't buy an Aether lens, a lot of the time you get caught out and die. Now in that fight, that didn't happen. But there's a chance it happens, and that chance can lose the fight for your team. And you might be saying, oh, but Holy Locky makes you tank. Yeah, it gives you an extra 300 HP. He'd have like 1700 HP now instead of 1300. But the cast range is what's going to keep you alive. You're going to probably die to a TA if you get jumped, okay? That 300 HP is not saving you from a, you know, an 800 damage meld strike, followed up by two right clicks. And so I'm such a fan of Aether First. I think it's better in almost all circumstances. You can at me on that, uh, but... Just, just, I don't know, just keep it in mind. I've seen a lot of people buying uh, it first. Hopefully someone can debate me on this. Maybe well, I, I hope to do that that at some point where maybe I just debate. Maybe I'll try to get AOI on. I feel like that'd be a lot of fun. We just debate like certain points. I'll just make up a list of points that are debatable in the Dota scene and, and discuss it. I, I think a lot of people would do that. He, he just, you know, he's a smart guy. So I feel like it'd be more fun. But okay, let's get back into the game. Once again, we're going to see another beautiful fight. You're going to see the execution come in. Um, I just want you guys to kind of see how it's like sort of layered in the same way as the Roshan fight. Axe in first, DP in second. The smoke was designed in that way. If you look at their conga line after uh, the conga line before, you can see the conga line is how you want it to be. Now, the only thing I would say is maybe Naga doesn't really want to be in the back. But to some extent, I honestly think it's okay, right? Because you kind of want to just counter initiate with Naga, which seems weird. But I, I, th I do believe it's the case. And that's exactly what we see. We see the snowball save. Talked about it. Just kind of overrated, in my opinion. Obviously, the snowball save is sort of going to kill crit uh, at some point. But yeah, Venom goes in. Honestly, EG does a good job here. The snowball save, definitely impact there. <laughs> like, I know I'm hated on it. It worked. It did its job there. Uh, Veno goes in, but the Veno just gets eviscerated by Naga. As much as I like the Shivas here, and I think it makes so much sense against this healing uh, comp, it's so much healing, it's also beast against Naga. There's no uh, there's no purge for the net, and so he just gets stuck, eventually dies to the second call. After that, we see a good curse onto the TA. It didn't actually in the game, I remember seeing it, and I'm like, I don't think that was that good, but it just bought enough time uh, where the, the TA does have to disengage, and it allows him to kill the Tusk on the side without any damage from the TA. And yeah, it just ends up being another good fight. As <laughs> Man, this DP is so annoying. This is what I'm talking about with this hero. I mean, her net worth is actually really high this game, just mainly because they're just winning fights. Uh, but even this Crypt Swarm cooldown talent, it's one of the best talents in the game. Can I just say that, guys? This Crypt Swarm talent makes it a 1.5 second cooldown. What? 
1.5? It's like arc lightning, but it does 300 damage. I mean, to be fair, arc lightning sort of does that, uh, you know, with the static field damage. But you have to keep in mind, Zeus can die. DP doesn't, like, Zeus, you do a lot of damage, but you have to stay in the back. You don't, you're not a tank for your team. You're still a tank with Crypt Swarm talent, and you shove waves like no one else. That's not true. There's other heroes that still show <laughs> waves, but huge fan of that talent. Next thing I want to say is Axe goes Axe here. A uh, bit of a bit of a side note, but I think it's kind of cool. It applies battle hunger to everyone who you call, which is probably the worst part of it. It's all right, but the main thing is you steal armor. It reduces the enemy armor of whoever you call by seven and puts it on you, which is cool as is. It, it's it's for the um. I think it's for the duration of the battle hunger, so if I'm not mistaken, not certain on that one. But it also, most importantly, reduces call cooldown by three seconds. So your call is an eight second cooldown. And usually, like, that's not... The only problem with that is that you kind of call based around your blink cooldown. But with how much kite EG has, especially the Veno and the traps, it kind of makes sense that he can't necessarily re-engage with blink. And so instead, he's just going to be YOLOing around, um, trying to call people. And I think the eight second cooldown in this game makes a lot of sense. But once again... We're going to see a clinical high ground from um, LGD going high ground with the Naga. At this point, the Naga, it has an Aegis. She has this butterfly. She's much, much tankier. I like the fact that she doesn't panic by heart this game. She already has two frontliners. She doesn't have to frontline. She can play that side lane counter initiator or side lane uh, pick off assassin as we saw in the last fight on the Veno. And we see it sort of again here as the illusions pick off the lion as she continues to siege with her butterfly damage. The illusions going for the Veno, killing him as well. And uh, yeah, this is where it was GG. You can see LGDs, their composure, their lane shove, their synergy, um, the spell casting. I mean, even just spell casting. People underestimate how important it is to be a good Dota player just to spell cast at the right time. I mean, look at the cold embraces this game. I don't think there's a single one where I'm like, yep, that was bad. Uh, no, I <laughs> I like them all, but yeah, great fight. At this point, EG was just going in one by one. They they had nothing left. I mean, there's no they they yeah, they they can't do anything. They can't kill anybody. This TV, I don't even think he has a damage item yet. I guess he's butterfly, but yeah. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed. I mean, I hope you enjoyed the tournament really as much as I did. I hope you enjoyed this analysis. I know it's very limbo, but I think I hope you guys kind of just like like information and like learning as much as I do. Uh, that's what I like to do when watching these games. I, I know because I, I could just like commentate the game, but that's what the panel did. So I sort of just want to talk about some ins and outs that hopefully the panel and, and players and Twitch chat, you know, as intelligent as they are, they didn't notice during the game. So I'll see you guys in the next one. It was a pleasure making this video for you. And I'll see you the next one. GG. And that's all. But remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below. And I'm out. Peace.